After the tremendous triumph that was the Avengers, Marvel Studios was set to take on the world with the next phase of their MCU. However, Marvel's overconfidence in troublesome micromanagement had them crashing face first into their own hubris, while also fighting an internal battle with their corporate overlords hell-bent on selling toys. The first wave of Phase 2 angered many of their filmmakers, who would call Marvel's process a shit show. I'm Groot. Yeah, you said that. For better or worse, the Avengers in 2012 changed cinema. The near-perfect melding of separate film franchises into one billion-dollar blockbuster could not be ignored. While every other studio still tries to emulate that success, none of them have been able to replicate it. Marvel Studios was a disruption not seen in decades. David Maisel, the mastermind behind the studio, theorized that the age of movie stars was over, and that intellectual properties, like superheroes, were more profitable than anyone who played them. And he was proven right. Anthony Mackie isn't a movie star. The Falcon is a movie star. And that's what's weird. It used to be with Tom Cruise and Will Smith and Stallone and Schwarzenegger. When you went to the movies, you went to go see the Stallone movie. The evolution of the superhero has meant the death of the movie star. The Walt Disney Company saw the potential of the Marvel brand, and especially the Marvel Cinematic Universe. For the very low price of $4 billion, they purchased Marvel Entertainment in 2009 when the MCU was only two films in. Paramount would still distribute Iron Man 2 and 3, Thor, and Captain America. The rest would be all Disney's. It was a win-win scenario for both sides. Marvel Studios would maintain their creative freedom, plus an enormous financial backing, and Disney would finally have a brand that reached a predominantly male demographic. After the sale, David Maisel cashed out and left Marvel. Marvel Studios went full bore into their next phase, an offhanded remark made by their studio head and MCU architect, Kevin Feige, that soon became the series' official phrasing. Since Avengers writer-director Joss Whedon delivered them a film beyond their wildest dreams, Marvel immediately signed him to a wide-reaching creative contract. Not only would he write and direct another Avengers film, but he had options to develop for Marvel television and was allowed to pass on all scripts leading up to Avengers 2. Marvel also established a writer's program, where young screenwriters were given properties to develop and occasionally help with on-set script rewrites. Started in 2009, the group was already eyeing Blade, Moon Knight, Luke Cage, and the Guardians of the Galaxy. By the next year, Feige was asking for Black Panther, Iron Fist, and Doctor Strange. Marvel was playing the long game. One of these writers was Drew Pierce. He was working on an adaptation of Runaways, about a handful of teenagers who discover their parents are supervillains. The project was eventually shelved and Pierce's internship came to an end. Out of work, Pierce sent an unsolicited pitch to Marvel, detailing his thoughts on how they should do a third Iron Man. Feige didn't care for any of those ideas, but appreciated his passion for the character and gave Pierce the job of writing the threequel. In July of 2012, Feige announced Phase 2, starting with Iron Man 3. Jon Favreau wasn't interested in returning as director. Both Iron Mans were incredibly difficult productions, because, among many things, neither had finalized scripts but hard release dates. And Marvel's CEO, Ike Perlmutter, was upset that Favreau fought for a raise on Iron Man 2, and subsequently was passed over for directing the Avengers, a job he wanted. The character no longer lit a fire under him, and he chose to hop on Disney's never-realized Magic Kingdom film. In his stead, Robert Downey Jr. suggested Shane Black. Not only did he write and direct Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, the film that made Favreau suggest Downey as Tony Stark. No, I think he means that when you say picture it inside your head, okay, is that a bullet will be inside your head or picture it in your head? Like Harry, form an image. He's got Look. a point. But Black gave mid-production screenplay suggestions for both Iron Man 1 and 2. As soon as Black was hired, he was paired with Drew Pierce to iron out a third film. This was news to Black. He assumed he would be the sole writer. Marvel had to convince him to give it a week. The two men immediately hit it off. Wow. Can I just say, sir? Yeah. I'm your biggest fan. Feige suggested the two finally introduce Iron Man's longtime nemesis, the Mandarin. However, Feige wanted them to avoid the villain's earlier racist depictions, as well as making it palatable for Chinese censors. This led to Black and Pierce deconstructing the very idea of how the media creates boogeymen. So the Mandarin became a literal focus group shell designed to stoke fear in Americans. 
the definition of Mandarin is not the king, it's the king maker. Mm -hmm. The guy behind the throne who sort of runs things from behind the scenes and whispers in the king's ear. And that's perfect. You've got a villain who's behind the scenes who sort of created this image of what he wishes or wants. All his evil impulses go into this creation that he never has to be in, under fire himself. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of fun. In retrospect, the casting of Sir Ben Kingsley as the fake Mandarin proved to be beyond inspired. What are you, decoy? You're a double, right? Well, I mean, not not study, no, absolutely not. Don't hurt the face, I'm an actor. Filming started in May of 2012 and went well for a few months before things began to fall apart. In August, Downey became overzealous on a stunt and broke his ankle. Because he had to do a stunt where he had to jump from one platform down to another platform and be on a cable and they wanted to rehearse it and he said no I don't need to rehearse it and he jumped and the guy holding the cable wasn't quite sort of ready or something and he landed hard and he broke his ankle so the film sort of shut down for like five or six weeks. When Downey came back they shot as much as they could with him being stationary before moving on to bigger things. During his absence though Marvel relied on visual effects supervisors to ascertain everything they could capture without him and even replaced a body double's head for the final scene. But in September, one of their go-to VFX houses, Digital Domain, filed for bankruptcy. Thanks in no small part to the predatory stranglehold Disney and Marvel themselves have on the visual effects industry. Digital Domain finished a handful of scenes for Iron Man 3, like the skydiving sequence, but their biggest task was the climactic Iron Legion sequence, and they couldn't even keep the lights on. Weta Digital was left to pick up the pieces. Whatever. Also in the midst of their downy downtime, Black and Pierce were forced to rewrite portions of the film to appease Kevin Feige's boss, Ike Perlmutter. Important sidebar for clarification, the New York-based Marvel Entertainment runs all things Marvel. Comic books, merchandising, games, TV shows, licensed films, and Marvel Studios, the California film company behind the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Disney may have bought Marvel, but at this point in time, only Marvel Entertainment controlled their movie productions. The man at the top was Ike Perlmutter, a shrewd CEO known for maximizing profits through extreme cost-cutting measures. As the MCU grew more and more expensive, Perlmutter tightened his grip on Marvel Studios. At first it was nickel and diming office supplies, then it was low-balling filmmakers' salaries, then it was straight-up demanding script changes. His main method of doing this was through the Marvel Creative Committee, a group of multiple high-level Marvel employees overseen by Alan Fine, president of Marvel Entertainment and right-hand man to Ike Perlmutter. The committee originally formed as a way to maintain faithful adaptations, but they quickly grew into armchair filmmakers, requiring all scripts and their revisions to pass through their validation. Many of their suggestions were about connecting and building out the cinematic universe, sometimes to the detriment of a film, like how they shoved the S.H.I.E.L.D. plotline into Iron Man 2. And since it came from New York corporate, Feige had to abide by their notes and choose his battles carefully if he didn't agree. The frequent back and forth bred an ideological rift among the two coasts. Nowhere was this more apparent than the creative decisions forced upon the MCU for the sake of toy sales. Ike Perlmutter and Alan Fine made their fortunes in the billion dollar toy industry, and that dictated what they wanted from the MCU. Marvel Studios wanted to make movies. Marvel Entertainment wanted those movies to sell toys. A famous man once said, we create our own demons. Let's track this from the beginning. When choosing their first films under their new studio, Marvel surveyed children to determine which properties elicited the most desirability from a toy perspective. It's no coincidence that the kids' top choices, an armor-suited Rocket Man and a hulking green monster, were the characters that kicked off the MCU. That mindset imposed countless decisions going forward. When Avengers was in pre-production, Perlmutter insisted on an all-male team as girls historically don't buy superhero action figures. Feige and Joss Whedon successfully fought to keep Black Widow in the lineup. However, any of her exclusive merchandise barely existed. Which brings us back to Iron Man 3. In the original script, the main villain was revealed to be Rebecca Hall's character, not Guy Pearce. Hall signed on thinking as much, yet Perlmutter and Fine blocked the idea because female baddies wouldn't sell toys. Throughout production, her and Stephanie Shostak's roles were severely diminished, with Hall being told they were simply going to kill her off before the third act. 
She hopelessly fought with Marvel to no avail, but negotiated at least one more scene with Downey. Even then, that scene was largely removed. On top of everything else, due to the production being co-financed by the Chinese company DMG Entertainment, Black had to shoot four pointless extra minutes exclusively for Chinese theaters, with plenty of product placement. Marvel never partnered with them again. Honestly, I hate working here. They are so weird. Iron Man 3 rocketed to theaters May 3rd, 2013. Unquestionably better than Iron Man 2, the third entry was amusing, inventive, mechanically sound, and the dynamic duo of Shane Black and Robert Downey Jr. will always be something worth seeing. Coming out of Avengers, Kevin Feige's biggest fear was whether audiences were willing to accept those same heroes returning to their own films. That fear was immediately crushed when Iron Man 3 grossed $1.2 billion worldwide. Nonetheless, the legacy of the film really comes down to one's opinion of the Mandarin bait and switch. Those open to the idea found it refreshing and ballsy, and think the film is the best of the three. And those who despise it, really despise it. Marvel knew it would be a controversial one, but they didn't expect how loud the fan backlash would become. Fortunately, for Marvel, Trevor Slattery, the actor pretending to be the Mandarin, was still alive. They initially filmed his death for the finale, but it was eventually cut. This loose end allowed Drew Pierce to write and direct the short All Hail the King, which conveniently retcons the twist by having an imprisoned Slattery get kidnapped by the real Mandarin, a plot that wouldn't resurface for nearly a decade. Stay tuned for Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings in eight years. Shane Black was not involved with the short. Feeling a bit betrayed, he saw it solely as an apology to fans, a theory Marvel denies. One down, five to go. If Marvel thought Iron Man 3 was hard, Thor 2 proved a never-ending assault of problem after problem. Director Kenneth Branagh was interested in returning, but the claustrophobic deadline without a known script was enough for him to leave Asgard. While searching for a new director, Kevin Feige was inspired by how David Yates went straight from TV to four back-to-back -back Harry Potter films. Marvel could tap into TV directors as a rarely used resource for talent, so they courted Brian Kirk after his work on Game of Thrones. He declined, but this led to Patty Jenkins, after a strong personal suggestion from Natalie Portman. Jenkins hadn't made a film since 2003's Monster, but again, her TV work, mainly the pilot to The Killing, was enough for her to be crowned Thor 2's director. The royal welcome didn't last long. Thor 2's script never reached a great place. It originally had Hela, the goddess of death, as the villain. So of course, Marvel HQ said no because, you know, toys. They had to pivot to Malekith, the dark elf. Don Payne started the script, but left after receiving a cancer diagnosis that would eventually claim his life. The film is dedicated to him. Robert Rodat gave it a whirl, then Christopher Yost, a writer's program alum, got it into better shape. Jenkins read this and couldn't see herself making it work. She didn't care to play within the established MCU, which would be a recurring theme among prospective filmmakers. But what truly blocked her vision was that she wanted to make an action light Romeo and Juliet style love story with Thor and Jane. The creative committee promptly said no. Again, how does that sell toys? They delayed the film to get things on track, but after only two months, Jenkins bailed, seeing the writing on the wall. Audiences wouldn't blame the bad script, instead it would be the fault of Marvel's first female director. If they hired any guy to do it, it was going to be no big deal. But I knew in my heart I could not make a good movie out of the story they wanted to do. And to Marvel's credit, on a movie that did not require a woman at all, they hired me. And so, you know, I've always been super grateful to them, even though it didn't work out. It was their loss, as Jenkins went on to direct DC's Wonder Woman, a legitimate cultural phenomenon. Something Marvel wouldn't experience until Black Panther in 2018. This news did not sit well with Natalie Portman. She was ready to take a hiatus from acting, but was reinvigorated when Marvel hired Jenkins, hoping she could continue to elevate more women's voices in Marvel's mostly boys club. However, when Jenkins left, Portman was livid. That was for New York. Hoping to mitigate the ordeal, Marvel invited Portman to help choose the next director. 
but she resigned to doing only what was contractually obligated of her. That same month, Marvel hired Alan Taylor, also because of his experience on Game of Thrones, among other prestigious TV work. Marvel wanted Taylor to bring that same rough realism to Asgard. Yet Taylor had his work cut out for him. Since Captain America screenwriters Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely had their Cap sequel in a good place and ahead of schedule, Feige tasked them with punching up Thor 2, mainly to streamline the plot before filming started. Even so, Taylor asked for more help, and Joss Whedon personally flew to the London set as they were filming. And Joss was airlifted in at one critical point, much to my relief, and did a pass on a couple of scenes and then airlifted out again. And uh, it was great. I mean, it, he sort of really brought those scenes to life. Um, but I want to be clear that all of our writers are wonderful, and that was just one little thing that he came in to do for us. As things went along, the movie continued to checkbox every shit show production trope. Joshua Dallas was overbooked and was replaced by Zachary Levi. Composer Carter Burwell left over creative differences. Christopher Eccleston, who beat out Mads Mikkelsen and Benedict Cumberbatch for Malekith, regretted selling out to sit in the makeup chair for hours on end a process he felt Marvel lied to him about. And Jamie Alexander fell down a metal staircase, pulling one shoulder out of socket, tearing the muscle of the other, slipping a spinal disc, and chipping 11 vertebrae. She had to sit out filming for a full month. I've got this completely under control. Is that why everything's on fire? Then post-production upended it all. Taylor loved the freedom he had during production, but once the edit started, he went from king to court jester. To Marvel, something was wrong with a very somber and dark film, front to back. Whether it was having Thor and Jane split at the end, or having Loki killed off for real, a choice that tanked with test audiences, the grittiness they wanted from Taylor was suddenly not what they wanted. Multiple cuts later, a question remained. What was the movie even about? Is there a point to all this? Because there really needs to be a point to all this. Right. Marvel always schedules reshoots and the high likelihood a film demands them. When we schedule our films, we schedule the production period, and then we schedule the additional photography period. People don't ask us anymore because they know it's the system, but they would go, oh, what will you be reshooting then? And we go, we don't know. <laughs> if we knew, we wouldn't do it. Reshoots are key to our films, starting with Iron Man 1. Because it's great, and, and we always say, you know, we're, we're, we're smart filmmakers. At, at Marvel, but we're not, you know, we're not geniuses. And the best way to give notes on a movie is to watch the movie. So we make the movie and then watch it and go, oh yeah, no, that's not, that's not right. <laughs> that doesn't work. Reshoots were inevitable, but for Thor 2, they were going to be extensive. Christopher Marcus, Stephen McFeely, and Joss Whedon gave their suggestions for fixes, and Marvel concluded they'd need 35 days worth of additional photography. Most indie films are made in half that time. Feige saw Marvel as the best in the business. Now they were eating crow. They knew this was their fault, but they believed they could salvage it. Please don't make this worse. Define worse. Major plot points were catapulted or reversed, and the tone was lightened across the board, with more action, more Loki, more cameos, and a lot of Eccleston's Malekith getting cut. Idris Elba found it torturous and humiliating, especially after just betraying Nelson Mandela. And Portman didn't bother showing up. Her time with Marvel was done. Well, for now. Stay tuned for Thor, Love and Thunder in nine years. Eight years, seven months, and six days. Elsa Pataki, wife of Chris Hemsworth, stood in for Portman for the post credit scene. And in one situation, three different actors were filmed in three different countries to be composited into a single frame. Feige calls it the three-continent shot. Alan Taylor partially blames himself for not being a writer-director type that could change things on the fly, and chose to trust in Marvel's reworking process. But ultimately, he believes his initial version was better. He called the experience a retching tug-of-war, and the final straw was shoehorning in the James Gunn-directed mid credit scene, for which Taylor wanted no ownership. Thor The Dark World converged on theaters November 8, 2013. Despite falling off the troubled production tree and hitting nearly every branch on the way down, the film came out... competent? Or to quote Chris Hemsworth, it was meh. It's certainly entertaining and the performances are fun, especially Tom Hiddleston, obviously, but the story feels overbloated, yet the villain half-baked, and there's an overall sense of paint-by-numbers filmmaking. This could be the example of a solo movie being a downgrade. Then again, the film grossed far more than the first Thor, with a total of 644 million worldwide.
Today, The Dark World consistently lands at the bottom of MCU rankings, something Marvel was keenly aware of moving forward with the character. When do we start? Nope. Skip this one for now. Phase two for us was continuing the stories we'd started in phase one and introducing new stories. We didn't want to be a studio that only made Iron Man films or later only made Cap or Thor or even just Avengers films. So it was important to us, and we always knew in phase two we wanted to do take another swing, and that was Guardians of the Galaxy. Hey. Deep inside the Marvel Studios offices, a member of the writer's program toiled away. Screenwriter Nicole Perlman only had one, uncredited, role at Marvel. As their resident sci-fi geek, she rewrote all of Jane Foster's astrophysics technobabble in the first Thor. But it was time for her to adapt something of her own. Handed a list of potential comic properties, and told by other studios that a woman will never be allowed to write a big-budget action movie, she gravitated toward the Guardians of the Galaxy. And we could choose which one we wanted to develop. And there was no guarantee that the movie would get made, but it was something they potentially could see making into a film. So Guardians was on the list, and I chose Guardians because it felt very science fiction in tone. And I loved the sort of funny vibe of the 2008 reboot of the comic. And it was uh, just Guardians of the Galaxy from there on out. Given absolute freedom, Perlman made the mad titan Thanos her primary villain, and the film's MacGuffin an Infinity Stone. Draft after draft, she mixed and matched until she found her favorite version of the team. Gamora, Drax the Destroyer, Groot, Rocket Raccoon, and Peter Quill, a.k.a. Star-Lord. Who? While Rocket was her personal favorite, Perlman worried it was going to be Marvel's Jar Jar Binks, an all-digital creation that fandom would collectively hate. But Kevin Feige thought Rocket was the key to it all. Perlman's script was beat for beat what is in the final film. From story points like Quill getting abducted while his mother dies and Groot sacrificing himself to save the Guardians, to the themes of Quill's connection to Earth via a cassette player, this one with 80s hits, and the overall idea that this was the origin of a family, not one hero. Perlman spent two years fine-tuning the script, never expecting it to be greenlit, and left Marvel. Then her script went up against Drew Pierce's Runaways for the creative committee to vote on which one would occupy Marvel's August 2014 release slot. Runaways was rejected, as a cast of teens of multiple genders and races would not sell, say it with me, toys. Guardians, on the other hand, screamed merchandising and was fast-tracked. Perlman came back for a few months, then Chris McCoy completed a short revision. Marvel had gone through 30 directors who never got the idea, especially after mentioning a talking tree and raccoon. Running thin, they heard an inspiring name when Joss Whedon recognized four filmmakers for elevating the superhero genre. Christopher Nolan, Sam Raimi, Jon Favreau, and James Gunn. Reason being, Gunn wrote The Specials, a low-budget comedy about a middling superhero group who fall apart after their toy line is unveiled. Managing that large, absurd ensemble is what Marvel needed. Problem was, Gunn didn't get the Guardians either. Stuck in traffic after the meeting, debating passing on the opportunity, Gunn started to relate to the outcast Rocket Raccoon and how his tragic backstory could ground the film. Let's say that there is a talking space raccoon. Where did he come from? How could he be grounded? How could I feel real about this character? And I realized that this was the saddest creature in the world. This was a little guy who was taken a little innocent animal and turned into something he didn't ask to be and was like nothing else in the universe. So he was completely alone. Well, I didn't ask to get made. I didn't ask to be torn apart and put back together over and over and turned into some, some little monster. To me, that's the seeds of the entire Guardians franchise. And we wouldn't know how tragic for another nine years. Stay tuned for Guardians of the Galaxy. Volume 3. James Gunn was a big question mark for Marvel. A writer-director known for riskier projects, like the uber-violent Super, Shut up, crime! and the adult film parody series, PG Porn. It was down to Gunn and future Marvel directors, Ant-Man's Peyton Reed, or Captain Marvel's directing duo, Anna Bowden and Ryan Fleck. Feige went with his gut and gave Gunn the pilot's seat. Gunn started with a rewrite, adding Nebula, completely reconceiving Yondu, and tying Perlman's music ideas into Quill's mixtape keepsake. 
Additionally, Gunn returned to Quill's comic origins as a space prince, although Joss Whedon had him take it out because royalty made him less relatable. Moreover, Whedon didn't see Gunn's voice in the first draft, and encouraged him to push the envelope further. For the record, I advised against trusting you here. They got my dick message! Whedon still did a dialogue pass on the script. Gunn enjoyed the freedom that his film was largely separate from the greater MCU, but it didn't mean that he was immune to the notes of the Marvel Creative Committee. They had him move Thanos to mere passing mentions and replace him with a smaller threat, Ronan the Accuser. Then during reshoots, they realized Ronan wasn't much of a threat, and added the scenes of him defying Thanos. Gunn detests this messy process. It was the hardest material for him to write, and in the end, he doesn't really like anything with Ronan. Not understanding the script's tone, the committee also outright told Gunn to remove all the needle drops of 70s rock songs. Marvel had a formula, why change it? Feige pushed back, and never heard a response. The view from New York was that Guardians was too outlandish to succeed, so it wasn't worth worrying about. And if it did fail, it would give them more power to force Feige to follow their instructions. So, production went by without many issues. Mark Ruffalo had to convince Josh Brolin that wearing a mocap suit would be worth the embarrassment. Zoe Saldana continually said no before Gunn gave her more to do than just silently stand around. And Gunn didn't get the casting suggestion of the 300-pound Chris Pratt until his audition. So the only thing you did was stop drinking beer? Yeah, I lost 50 pounds in one month. How much beer were you drinking? <laughs> I know, right? Had Pratt said no, it would have been Glenn Howerton. I mean, I came in there, right, and I was polite, and I was nice to them, I was cordial, and they completely goddamn disrespected me, little idiots! Idiots! Initial test screenings weren't great, mostly because the VFX for Rocket and Groot were extremely rough. That said, Feige knew that they were on the right track when Pratt and the soundtrack received high marks. Reshoots, besides the Thanos stuff, were used to flesh out Drax's character by elaborating on his backstory and his non-metaphor mindset. His people are completely literal. Metaphors are gonna go over his head. Nothing goes over my head. My reflexes are too fast. I would catch it. As they neared the finish line, Feige and the rest of Marvel Studios suddenly grew very paranoid they were drinking their own Kool-Aid. It was a massive gamble. A virtually unknown property, an untested lead star, two fully CG characters, juvenile humor throughout, and no Avenger to market it with. Not to mention, comic book movies in space haven't had a great track record. Flying past its planned budget, costing a total of $232 million, they were too far along to do anything about it. It was time to face the music. Being the first female writer in the MCU, many outlets wanted to interview Nicole Perlman about her experience. She often praised Gunn's changes, as he added that irreverent humor she couldn't quite capture. But Gunn wanted that title card to read, Written and Directed by James Gunn and Perlman's contributions stood in the way of that. He began a subtle, but ugly, campaign of discrediting her work. Whether it was alluding to how the Writers Guild only gave her recognition since she wrote the first draft, or the rumors that he leaked info to fan-friendly sites that he did a page one rewrite. The fight went into arbitration, where Perlman had to defend her work against Gunn's disinformation. When she handedly won, she threw a f James Gunn party. Guardians of the Galaxy rocked out on August 1st, 2014, and was a surprising success. Critics and audiences alike couldn't resist the combination of charming leads, sly wit, zany tone, fantastic visuals, and an unexpected level of heart. It outperformed Marvel's predictions, grossing $773 million worldwide, becoming the third highest grossing film of 2014. And that soundtrack the committee fretted over? It sold nearly 2 million copies. Feige said it was the best example of audiences validating their most esoteric instincts. In other words, it was proof of concept that Marvel could turn anything into gold. For now. Phase 2 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe got off to a rocky start, and the worst was yet to come. Marvel had a monster in their own house, as the creative committee continued to suffocate their own creatives. But as they say, the night is darkest just before the dawn. Oh wait, that's from Batman. Oh well, it still applies. Hey, did you know you could watch part 4 right now?